Welcome back to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. I cannot be more thrilled today to introduce our guest. In fact, I am here with my two favorite parenting experts. Um, Of course, you already know my husband, Dr. Daniel Amen. But I was introduced to Dr. Jim Fay with Love and Logic, the Love and Logic Institute, um, a few years ago, about actually about nine years ago now, when my daughter, um, who is very, very strong-willed, uh, was giving me a lot of trouble. So I am super excited to introduce Dr. Fay. He's become one of America's most sought-after presenters in the fields of parenting, positive discipline, and classroom management. Along with Foster Klein, MD, he's the co-founder of the Love and Logic Institute and co-author of the bestseller, Parenting with Love and Logic. He's sort of become a Pied Piper for parents, providing practical teaching and parenting techniques and encouraging adults to become consistent and effective in their efforts with kids. Jim Fay has over 30 years of experience in education, serving in public, private, and parochial schools in a variety of roles, including elementary education, art and music teacher, school principal, and administrator. And he's been consulting and speaking about parenting and education for more than 30 years, founding the School Consultant Services, which is the sister company to the Klein Fay Institute in 1977. So super excited to have you, Dr. Fay. Uh, the excitement is mine. Uh, get a chance to talk about kids. What uh, what can go wrong, huh? Absolutely. So, so I, Dr. Fay, I've recommended your book Love and Logic to literally thousands of patients over the years, and find you know it incredibly helpful. Start by talking to us about how you develop this, and some of the overarching principles behind it. Oh, glad to do that. Uh, Well, I started out, uh, see, I'm a child of the 30s and the 40s, with a very autocratic dad, uh, my way or the highway, and I thought the way you raised kids was you keep them scared, and (laughs) (laughs) so I became a teacher. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I could start out uh, back in the 50s scaring kids into doing their work, but the, that didn't last very long. The, the world changed, and I hadn't, and then I was having all kinds of problems. So uh, um, one day I uh, had this little uh, kid with a reactive attachment disorder, and uh, I had uh, failed so miserably with him all year long that uh, we ended up in an altercation where he got slapped, and he turned out to be a bleeder, and he bled all over the school. And if I hadn't had a wonderful relationship with his mother, and she knew how hard I was working with it, and the fact that it was 1960s instead of now, I wouldn't even be around. So I got out looking for every bit of information I could find. I was reading every psychology book I could find. And by then, I, as I was working my way through this, I actually became a principal of a school, And there was a wonderful man there by the name of Dr. Foster Klein, psychiatrist. And he had a little boy at our school. And we made friends because he was really interested in schools. And I was really interested in psychology. So it was a good match. So we got together and we started teaching people about, uh, well, the importance of having limits for kids in a loving way and the importance of kids learning through experience and so on. But uh, it, uh, half the people we talked to said, boy, this stuff works like dynamite. And the other half said, oh, thanks for nothing. Now our kids are more angry and (laughs) obstinate than they were before. So we start uh, trying to figure out what in the world was going wrong uh, with those that didn't seem to make it work. And uh, we finally got tired of, studying sick people, and we started looking at people who did really well and watching a bunch of really effective parents and teachers, and we found out that they were doing things a lot different, using a lot of empathy with their kids, a lot of understanding, but still holding their kids accountable. So uh, as we moved along, things kind of developed into four uh, basic core beliefs, and uh, the first one was that uh, whatever we did with our kids, we want to maintain both their dignity and our dignity. And it paid to get them thinking more than us. 
and uh, sharing the control. And then the big secret was that uh, when kids had to be punished or consequenced, we needed them in the thinking mode instead of the fighting mode. And that meant locking in a lot of empathy first before you tell them the bad news about the consequence. So those have remained the uh, core beliefs since we started. And our big goal is to raise kids who have a little voice, little voice in their head that says, wow, I wonder how my next decision is going to affect me. And if you do that, you don't worry about your kids so much. Yeah, it's it's been so incredibly helpful for me. So just to give you a really quick um, idea why I'm so excited to have you here, we had this very strong-willed child, and one day when she was just turning five, I broke down, started crying, and I started praying, and I thought, there's no instruction manual for this kid, and it's not supposed to be this hard. I intuitively knew that parenting <laughs> shouldn't be that hard. And it's the only time I ever felt like I got an answer from God when I got two people actually recommended your book to me. And I realized something. My problems with my child were really my responsibility. The problems with communication yeah. were up to me to figure out, not a five-year-old. And it, when I got your book, it literally changed the way I thought. I'm one of those parents who's very probably like your dad more authoritative and autocratic. And I figured if I told her to do something, she should just do it. Only she had a very different idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's worked out so well for us. Those strong-willed kids make really great adults. Oh, she's amazing. You know, they live that long. You yeah, know, my, daughter is, my daughter is now 13. I just have to brag for a second <clears> because <throat> she went from being so difficult for me to my friends literally hate me because at 13, their kids are starting to go sideways and having attitudes. And my daughter is so loving, responsible. She's hyper responsible, if anything. And we have this incredible relationship. So it's, it really works if you understand how to implement it, I think. So, so Isn't let's, that something to cherish? Yeah. Yes. Let's break down these in a practical way. So the first principle is dignity. T talk about what that means in interactions between parents and children? Well, uh, what we teach parents is that um, when there's a problem, sometimes it's pretty hard to maintain your own dignity. And uh, one of the tricks in love and logic, which violates most everything we were taught in college, is that when things go south with your kid, you want to buy a bunch of time. You want to be able to say to them, man, this really makes me mad. I make better decisions when I calm down. Give me some time to figure this out. I'll get back to you. That's then if brilliant. you feel especially vindictive, you can always say, try not to worry about it in the meantime. <laughs> I use that one a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, buying time, you know, I, how many um, incidents of child abuse do you think there are in America where People are at their wits' end, really frustrated, and the part of their brain that's operating is not frontal cortex. It's, <laughs> it's brain stem. And then they do something they wish they hadn't have done because back in their head is this silly notion that uh, we have to have an immediate consequence or we lose the chance to teach the kid anything. Yeah, no, that was really helpful for me. I remember one incident where... Um, I've only swatted my daughter on the rear a couple of times when she was little, but one of the times that I spanked her, she was three years old and she turned around and looked at me and said, why are you hitting me? How does that help? <laughs> I thought, okay, I, am, I have oh. my hands full with this kid, so. <laughs> oh, it's rough when the kids are suddenly smarter than you right? are, isn't it? <laughs> Very frustrating, actually. Well, I never spanked her again. It was a waste of time. I realized that. And that's why I love your book, which is based on real life consequences. Um, it's one of the things I learned. So the second principle is shared control. Um, talk about that. Well, you know, control is a, is a big deal for human beings. I mean, it's one of the basic human needs. And uh, when we try to take all the control, they're going to try to get it back. But if we can uh, give them lots of little choices that don't mean anything to us, we can actually build up a savings account in their mind uh, of control. Uh, 
it's kind of like, you know, when I'm around this person, I don't have to fight to get my control needs. Now they're probably making the little decisions that don't mean anything. Do you want blue socks or red socks? Do you want uh, orange juice or milk? You know, um, do you want to leave the party right now or do you want to wait for 10 minutes? We always ask them that 10 minutes before we want to go, right? <laughs> but uh, the more of those little decisions that they're making and the more of those control needs are being met, it's like a savings account in, that you build up. And then you can take a withdrawal every once in a while because we have a responsibility as parents to boss kids around from time to time and say, this is the way it has to be. So that's when we can say to them, wow, aren't I usually pretty reasonable? Don't I usually let you make a lot of decisions when I can? Well, it's my turn now. Thanks for understanding. And you're taking a withdrawal from the account. Something I could have never done in my autocratic early days as a parent and a teacher is don't put anything into the account. You can't take anything back. So one of my favorite examples is homework used to be uh, stressful Nightmare. for for Tana. And after she read Love and Logic, she just looked at Chloe and said, it's not my homework, it's your homework if you want to do it. Awesome. If you don't and you want to repeat the third grade, it's completely up to you. You'll make yeah. new friends. <laughs> Oh, she got so mad. I said, honey, I love you so much. I'm never going to make you do homework again. And she was immediately suspicious. She looked at me like, so, she's like, what? That doesn't make sense. Because we used to fight every night. And I said, no, I love you so much. And then I told her, you know, I said, you'll make new friends. I said, I wouldn't be happy with the consequences that go with that. But if you're okay with it, they're your grades, not my grades. My daughter, I've never sat down with her to tell her it's time to do homework again. She's if anything, paranoid. <laughs> She's very anxious about her homework. Um, I never yeah. took homework to school. And she now has a 4.0, and she is still anxious about getting work done early. So yeah, it's, that gets into that no sense in both of us worrying the syndrome that, uh, boy, if my parents aren't going to worry about this, somebody better. Right. That's but exactly what happened. But if they've got all the worry, why should I waste my time with it? That is exactly what happened. She thought I was going to be the one in charge of it. So she yeah. didn't. It was just brilliant. And the other one I used, the other tip I used from your book that I just love, um, which stunned her. And to this day, she thinks I, you know, we have an amazing relationship, but she just thinks it was one of the most horrible things I ever did. She threw a temper tantrum like none other one day. And so I gave her 20 minutes to cool down. I needed the 20 minutes. I gave her 20 minutes to cool down in a room. And while she was in there, I called. We were supposed to go on a very special family trip that day and um, do something together. And so I called someone to come babysit. I, I've never, <laughs> keep in mind, I've never had a babysitter ever. And so she shows up and my daughter thinks this person's going with us. And she's like, oh, yay, let's go. And I'm like, I handed a list of chores to the babysitter. I said, when she's done with her homework and her chores, then you guys can go swimming or do something fun, but not until then. And Chloe's jaw hit the floor. And I looked at her and I said, it's okay, honey. I said, I will give you an advance on next week's homework. I, I, on wow. allowance. I'll give you an advance on next week's allowance. So you can pay the babysitter. And if you still don't have enough, she takes toys for payment. I learned that from you. <laughs> so before she could scream, I ran out of the house. Never again did she do that. Never yeah, again. It's, a, it's funny. You do effective things. You don't get to do them very often. Nope. You do ineffective things. You get to do them over and over and over and over. Isn't that true? So yeah, I was almost looking forward uh, to doing it again, but it never happened again. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you know, it's always a telltale thing when the parents say, I tell him and I tell him and I tell him. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, that must not be very effective then. Yep. You know, so, one so of the... Um, those are consequences with empathy. Mm -hmm. So I really... And I didn't like have to get mad. I usually get mad. You know, I used to get really mad at her. And instead, I didn't need to get mad because it was on her, just like you said. I now said, you know... This is, this is what happens. I use your line all the time when you drain my energy or you use my energy for something else when I need to be focusing on something important and now I don't have time to do those things or I don't do things for kids who treat me that way and neither should you. So we would teach her that and it just worked out so well. All things I you know, have learned in your book and it's funny because my, my husband has some amazing tips but it's sometimes harder to hear it from your spouse. So, so <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to be able to hear it from him. <laughs> right, exactly. So it worked well for both of us. And the last one well, is uh, shared thinking. Um, I, I like that one a lot. Uh, 
talk, talk about well, we, how that came up. We find that um, anytime you tell a kid something, that's your reality. Anytime he has to think and come up with an answer, now it becomes his reality. So uh, the more we talk to our kids in questions, as opposed to statements, the better off we are. Wow, how do you think you're going to solve that? Would you like to hear what some other kids have tried before? You know, that causes uh, the kids to do lots of thinking. Where we, We're so programmed to believe that it's our job to tell them how to think all the time. Yeah, and they're actually pretty It was pretty kind of smart. funny when that book, uh, that uh, first book was commissioned by the Navigators, uh, a, a Christian publishing company, and they called up and they said, we'd love for you to write this book. And they said, uh, we're down here in Colorado Springs with the uh, with Jim Dobson. He has a company not far away from there, focused on the family. Right. He said uh, their concern was he's teaching everybody how to think, and your books teach people how to think, and that's what we want. Right. Well, it certainly so, works for uh, me. When you have a strong-willed child, it's if you tell them how to think, I can almost guarantee if you've got a kid like mine, she will immediately dig her heels in. So I locked in the <laughs> empathy, and I only offered the advice when she wanted it. So I would just say, oh, sweetie, I'm so sorry. Um, that that yeah. I know that's really horrible. And then I would wait for her to sort of get panicky. And then, then I would say, or if she asked, I would say, so would you like to know what other people have tried? But I couldn't even do that until she was ready to hear it. Yeah, that, uh, that whole idea of um, relationships, I mean... So who do you like the best? People who are always telling you what to do or people who sit back and uh, seem to have that knowledge and are willing to share it with you if you ask for it. Well, and the nice thing, we're going to talk more about this in the teen section, but the nice thing is, is that when you lock that in young and they start to think for themselves, I now have a 13-year-old whose friends call her mom because she now thinks so much for herself um, that she is not swayed by other people's thinking. Mm-hmm. And so now she's used to thinking for herself. She's used to coming up with solutions that work. And it's great. Well, it, you know, she, she also took uh, an online test. Uh, what's your age? Your mental age. Your mental age. And uh, her friend took it and got four years old. Another friend took it, got seven years old. And they asked her how she scored. And she said, I'm not going to tell you. She goes, I'm like a soccer mom. (laughs) She was 43. Her her mental age came out at 43. And mine actually came out at 42, which means I'm younger than she is. It's so funny. In many ways. But that's what I say. Child psychiatrists are really Well, you know, there's so much talk about um, teenagers not really, well, their brain's not maturing until uh, much later. But uh, as I remember back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and so on, I bet if you gave those same tests back there, it, uh, it would have come out different. Yeah, because they were forced because to be responsible. kids were forced to think for themselves early in life back in those days. And then uh, something kind of changed along the way. Uh, it, it became the parents' job to think for their kids. Right. And uh, along with the helicopter parent movement, there came that uh, the thing where we started thinking for the kids, and brains don't seem to develop the same way. I'm not an expert on that like, yes. like you guys are, but so I interesting. A, I kind of have an idea that might be true. So stay with us. We are going to come back and talk with Dr. Fay about parenting small kids And then we're going to talk about teenagers and then young adults. Get his book, Parenting with Love and Logic. And they have amazing tips um, that they send out weekly. I always thought they were very helpful. Um, You can go to uh, loveandlogic.com or Parenting with Love and Logic. What is it, Dr. Fay? Loveandlogic.com. Loveandlogic.com. And they've got these simple tips they send out every week that are so amazing. Stay with us. Welcome back. 
I'm Dr. Daniel Amen. I am here with Tana, and we are continuing our series on love and logic, uh, parenting with love and logic with Dr. Jim Fay. We are so excited uh, to have him here with us. And um, Dr. Fay, we want to talk about little kids and your best tips teaching parents over the last three decades, um, what's the best way parents can start uh, with love and, and logic? And when should they start? Yeah, that uh, <clears throat> is interesting. You know, that first year of life, those little kids are just a bundle of needs that they cannot fulfill themselves. So they cry, and uh, we pretty well know that there's some important need needs to be fulfilled, and we should do that. About the time they get to be a year old, then they become a bundle of needs and a bundle of wants. And when they cry, we can't tell which it is. But uh, we found that uh, the more simple you make this, the happier parents are. Uh, we've uh, found parents who have read so many psychology books that they're afraid to, to say anything to their kids. So we generally say once they're about uh, oh, one year of age, we want to make sure we're having so much fun with them when everything is going right. There's all this laughing and giggling and touching and smooching and being silly so the kids really want to be around us. And then when things don't go right, instead of figuring out, oh, what's going on here and all that, we... We use the oh song, and the oh song is actually, we sing it. And the reason we sing this when kids do something wrong is we can't be angry and sing a song at the same time, because it's that anger and frustration that makes things worse. So there's some steps to follow, and people who follow these uh, steps find out when their kids are 16 years of age, they can say, oh, oh, and the kids know that they'd better toe the mark. So <clears throat> first, uh, first step is, oh, oh, and we just sing that out big and bold like that. Oh, oh, little bedroom time. This is so sad. Or, oh, oh, little playpen time. This is so sad. And we whisk them off to their room. Now, usually they're kind of upset at that point. And especially with the strong-willed kids, it's good to use a little paradoxical, paradoxical psychology with them. I like to say on the way to the room, <clears throat> have a nice little fit. We'll see you when you're sweet. Oh, and off good. they go into the room. And <laughs> some people have written me letters about that. Oh, why would you say that to a kid? Well, you tell a strong-willed kid to do something, and you can be pretty sure he won't do it, right? Or the opposite. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, Get them into the room now, and we give them some choices so we can share control. We say, uh, do you want to stay in there with the door open or door shut? And your strong-willed little kids will come roaring right back out, and then we say, how sad. You chose shut. And uh, now you want to be in there with a shut or lock. Now, I don't like a kid in a locked room because of all the danger issues there. So... Uh, we advise parents to keep a little washcloth handy and wedge it between the door and the door jam up high where the child can't reach it. So that, in fact, actually disables the door. But if there was a fire or something, we could hit that door with our hand and it would pop right open. So we've covered that safety issue there. But they're going to go in there until they're perfectly calm <clears throat> and then they're not going to come out at that point. See, time out was the big thing for years, you know, time out, time out. But time out really never worked very well. And one of the reasons it never worked very well is kids came right back out as soon as they were calm. They never had a chance to really settle down and think about why they were in there. So uh, we advise parents once the child is calm, and never, ever before, uh, regardless of how long it takes, once he's calmed down, 
Then we say, well, sweetie, you're calm. I'll set the timer. And if you're still calm, when the timer goes off, you can be with us. So I like five minutes. And I don't think it's too abusive to insist that a kid learn how to be calm yeah. for five minutes. You and know. That's interesting. So, My husband had that same uh, philosophy with, you know, when we we called it time out, but it was essentially sort of what you're talking about now. But he would say, we would always say, um, you taught me to say, it doesn't start until you are quiet. And so then yeah. she would have that time. And I literally had to sit with her for an hour one time because she was really small. So I had to like, I didn't sit with her, but I had to wait for her for an hour um, for yeah. her to be calm. She just chose to keep screaming. <laughs> so, and but the time went really, really slow for you, Tana. Yeah. <laughs> and it went really, really fast for her because she was in brainstem, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I've, I've known parents who actually train their kids to have long rages by uh, trying to hold out for a little while and then letting the child out while they're still in a rage. So they uh, start to learn, well, the way to get my way is to have a rage. Yep. And that's counterproductive. Yeah. So the, this uh, timer business becomes really, really important that um, they, they has to start only after they're calm. Then once they come out of their room... They meld back into the family, maybe a little hug, but we don't need to talk to them about while they were in there. You know, the, the family dog could figure out why he was in there. We don't want to <laughs> treat our kids like they're not as smart as the family dog. Oh, that's funny. So, uh, but uh, they, you know, there's actually books out there teaching you how to make sure that your kids understand everything they do or that you do to them. And, that's kind of like saying, you poor, stupid, pathetic little thing, you can't figure it, this out, I have to explain it to you. Never have to tell Rex, the family dog, anything. He figures it out. So, yeah, yeah. Where people will get in trouble on this is uh, they will forget to do it as a song. You know, there's an old thing about, uh, well, will they have a negative association with their room? Well, if you do it the old way with anger... You get in that room, you know, you settle down. Well, they're going to associate it in a negative way, but going in there with a song and the parent being happy as a lark, uh, it just doesn't happen that way. So, so, they so, don't so need to be the attitude to that. is so important. I think that's the biggest thing I saw Tana change is yeah. that she became her coach. She had more empathy there was less of sort of the negative chatter. Right. And yeah. that was huge. But it's so a practice. If, <laughs> if, you know, I always say to parents, always try to be curious, not furious. And if you can <laughs> yes. stay, keep with that mindset, then you begin to parent with empathy. Well, but what I just want to point out one thing is that it did take a lot of practice. Um, I used to listen to your CDs. It'll tell you how long ago it was. Um, CDs in the car, and I would listen to them over and over and over. And it probably took a good year, year and a half for me to change my behavior. Because, you know, I had 40-some years on the planet of doing things a certain way, and I had to change that. So by the time I finally... Well, and your history... Right. And and this would be a good important topic for us to talk about what you grew up in. Chaos, drama, with, trauma. You know, a, a a very loving mother, but it's like my way or the highway. But also constant drama. Constant drama because of having ADD wow. in your house. Right. And then a a dad who was absent, but when he was present, um Dictatorial. And, and both you and I are um you know, devout Christians, but he was a pastor and but didn't rigid really live it and mean, right? But rigid and mean, and so if you have that as the model, even though you don't like it, it's part of the program. It's what I knew that that happens, and so when Chloe's being disrespectful, it would just 
flip you out. Right. It would really irritate me. So it took time. I think that's the point is the first thing was the awareness that I didn't want my daughter to grow up in the same environment that I did. And so I was willing to do the work, to find the answers, to do that work. You have to be recognize it and be willing to change it. But then know that it's not always going to happen immediately. Like you have to work at it. You're the parent and you've got habits that you might need to work on and that's okay. So I was sort of gentle with myself on that, but I would listen over and over and over. And, and that's the beautiful thing about Love and Logic. It's not just the book. There's the Institute. There are courses that people MP3 can take. MP3 downloads. And, and you know, in, the, in a society with an eight-second attention span, um, it's very important to commit to deep learning rather than, you know, give me the four tips to be a great parent. Oh, yeah. no, you have to submerge yourself. I'm going to tell you right now. The tips are awesome as a reminder, but you have to just submerge yourself in the material. Because you're the parent and you have to, you've got to start, if you don't want the same outcome, quit doing the same things, right? But that takes, that's a habit you have to develop. You know, that's why we put so much on CD still. <clears throat> People need to listen to those in their car, you know, and listen over and over and over. And uh, people worry, they say, but what if my kids hear these things? Good. Well, the beauty of love and logic is even if the kids know what you're going to do, they can't do anything about it. Right. The best they can do is just say, I hate it when you're sad for me. Yeah. Well, I could be mean if that would help. You know? Right, right. It's funny. Yeah, it's just been so, so... And the CDs are actually really funny, so they help. It makes it easier to listen to. Yeah. So. But one of the things we've found is that um, the people who make the fastest progress on Love and Logic are the people who don't try to learn everything at once. They pick out one technique and uh, they say, I'm just going to work on that one thing until I master it, no matter how long it takes. And that's funny. That's what and, we teach. Uh, we always suggest that parents start out working on begging, back talk, and arguing. Because it's such a simple thing to uh, deal with and uh, once you get that under control, everything else goes a lot easier. And if you never get that under control, it doesn't matter what techniques you know, they won't work. So uh, we teach people just to go brain dead when their kids start begging and arguing. And they say once what their stance is on it. Uh, let's suppose the kid is saying, it's not fair. Let's say... Uh, and they never do that when you're offering them ice cream. It's right. uh, when you set a limit, right? They're going to test the limit. It's not fair. And the answer is, could be, and what did I say, and turn and walk away. And That's... if they want to come back with, yeah, but my friends have to, could be, and what did I say? So that they hear the same thing every time when they try to do something that they shouldn't be doing. It's, uh, <laughs> that's funny. I have a saying that I, uh, said to my daughter when she, cause she did the whole, it's not fair thing. And I would look at her and I'm like, honey, fair is a place where they sell bad food and farm animals. It has yeah. nothing to do with life or the situation. And she had no idea what I was talking about, but it <laughs> totally confused her, but she would stop, you know, she would stop it. I'm like, life's not fair, was, babe. No one told you it should yeah, be fair. It was the same thing every time. And she knew it wasn't going to pay off, uh, that arguing and uh, back talk and begging is not going to pay off. We also started there was an old uh, farmer who uh, the only thing he'd ever say to his kids when they'd start to argue, he'd say, well, Jane, no time for making kitten britches. Oh, yeah, that's cat funny. pants. That's she so said, funny. We never knew what that meant, but I grew up, and when my kids started to argue, I heard the same thing. I, it, it was coming out of my mouth. And I called up my dad, and I said, I can't believe I'm talking just like you did. Now, what did that mean? We never knew what it meant. That's he funny. said, uh -huh. Jane, I don't rightly know. I just kind of figured when a kid says something that ain't too bright, you should just match it up. <laughs> That's hilarious. So we're Highly gonna, effective, um, say the same thing every time. Yeah, I love it. So on our next seg segment, we ought to talk about kids who uh, are uh, strong-willed and defiant and how we can uh, create a mantra that uh, will mean something to them. 
Yeah, I love that. So, and I want to end as we go into our next segment on kids who are a little bit older. Um, one of the things that, as she got older, when she would say something's not fair, I would, now she can rationalize better. And I would just say to her, honey, life, no one told you life was going to be fair. It's what you make it. And we started, that yeah. was my mantra. And so she started taking responsibility then. And that worked really well for us, but I had to say it a lot. <laughs> so. Well, we are yeah, going to we'll come back. We'll talk about uh, how you can give them a chance to have their say in a really healthy way during right. this next session. Well, we're going to come back and talk about what may be the hardest part of parenting, which is parenting with teenagers. Uh, stay with us. We are here with Dr. Jim Fay, the author of uh, Parenting with Love and Logic. You can learn more about his work at loveandlogic.com. They have amazing courses. There are email tips you can get for free. So stay with us. Welcome back to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. I'm Dr. Daniel Amen. I am here with Tana. And our very special guest, Dr. Jim Fay, is with us. He is the author of Parenting with Love and Logic, uh, the co-founder of the Love and Logic Institute, uh, where they have courses and lots of support for you. And today we're going to talk about teenagers, parenting with love and logic for teenagers. And it, it's very important for me to say that it is not normal for teenagers to be problematic all the time. There's actually a big study People in Chicago that, where a third of teenagers never had any problem. Uh, another third, it was periodically they would have a problem. But there's a third of teenagers where they would have significant problems, runaway, drug abuse, school failure, uh, and, and so on. They often uh, get held up as, well, adolescent years right. are uh, normally tumultuous. Uh, so that's the mantra I hear from a lot of parents but, but is that this is, is normal. But, and that is often the excuse right. not to recognize when there are significant problems. Yeah, that's a huge cop out. But do you know who? Which teenagers do you hear about all the time? Right, yeah, the ones with really problems. You, you hear about the troubled ones. Uh, exactly. Often it's so clearly brain problems can contribute. You know, if you have undiagnosed depression, ADHD, having a autism. traumatic brain injury, uh, and being but, somewhere on the but autism. But even spectrum. those kids who have brain issues, parenting. You know, it's funny, Dr. Fay. when I was doing my child psychiatry fellowship, uh, they actually taught me to do play therapy with ADHD kids. And uh -huh. I hated the children. I mean, because they didn't get better. <laughs> and, you know, we'd yeah. spend an hour playing war and nothing changed. And then the second year, uh, I was involved in parent training and all my kids got better. So it was <laughs> right. clear to me <laughs> that putting um, smart parenting skills into families was one of the most effective things I could do for kids, including teenagers. Talk about your experience with uh, parenting with love and logic for teens. Yeah, we have so many love and logic parents who tell us that the the teenage years are really a joy. Yeah, they are for kids us. Kids are fun to be around and all that. Um, but uh, they also have a lot of questions about uh, how much does a kid need to be involved with the family and that kind of thing. And uh, we're strong believers that kids need to belong to a gang, you know, the family gang. And we're all in this together, trying to survive this world and get through it. So... Uh, chores become very important uh, that they continue through those teen years. I'm, I'm a strong advocate that um, each child in the family, by the time they're about seven, eight years of age, um, are responsible for one family meal per week. 
and that is planting it, cooking it, serving it, and cleaning it up. And uh, it's funny how the kids, well, I, I shouldn't be a slave around here. I don't like to cook. And before long, you find out they're really enamored with cooking. But what I think it really is, and I know it really is, is they're, they're meeting a very basic need. You know, when uh, Maslow gave us the hierarchy of basic human needs, he told us uh, limits, you know, physical and emotional safety, um, love and affection, healthy amounts of control. And this one that gets discarded so often in families is a sense of being an important, valued member of a family. And if a kid lives like an honored guest in the home, why should he have any attachment to this place? You know, it's just a rental place for him. Uh, interesting. It's like a rental car. You know, yeah, you won't know, that's, be here forever. Love that. Yeah. That's so interesting because our daughter actually likes doing chores. And we think part sure. of it's because she now feels competent. Um, she likes being in charge of her own life. She's still strong willed, but now it's directed in a positive way. And those chores. Um, give her a sense of purpose and she is good at it and she knows she's good at it and she's a little worker bee. So I think a lot of it has the attitude. Yeah. So um, by the time kids are teenagers, I always say to them, I hope that you get so good at your chores. Uh, We call them contributions to the family, but I hope you get so good and so fast at those things that they don't interfere with any other life that you want to have, you know, your work life, your social life, or whatever, but still your family life comes first. And uh, if we're paying kids to do the chores, they're not part of the gang. So uh, we, uh, we have chores that uh, they do for free, just like I, um, I don't charge the family to take care of the bills and all of that. Right. So, and I don't charge them to drive the car. I don't pay my kids to do those, but we do put a list on the refrigerator of the parents' most hated chores up for bid. And uh, they can bid on those chores if they want to earn extra money beyond their allowance. Yeah, that's exactly what we do. Yeah, the only problem in our house was uh, we were teaching about a free market economy. So the neighbor kids knew that that list was there too, and if they outbid our kids, so be it. Oh, that's funny. (laughs) <laughs> oh, that's really funny. So the, you yeah. would allow the neighbor kids to make the money instead. <laughs> kind of in the, in tack there. That's awesome. Uh, <clears throat> that's awesome. So, um, let's spend some time and talk about technology. It is oh. such a huge issue. Um, I had a patient recently who was, uh, you know, sending inappropriate pictures, a really pretty 12-year-old girl, uh, sending completely inappropriate pictures to a boy. Well, that's actually a very common thing. That's actually, sadly enough, not considered that big of a deal um, with a lot of kids now in our culture because they don't understand the consequences. Oh, yeah. So that's, that's why during our first session we talked about the goal of love and logic is to raise kids who have a little voice in their side their head. It says, I wonder how my next decision is going to affect me. And and if we have trained our kids from early childhood uh, to listen to their peers, and that's what happens to a lot of parents. They actually go through a training session with their kids to train their kids only listen to their peers. And the way they do that is in the early years, while the brain is in formal operations, They're saying to the kids, do it because I said to, do it my way or else. And then when the kids make a mistake, they say, you should have listened to me. So they're locking that in for about 11 years. Uh, Listen to a voice outside your head. Then the brain starts to make that switch where it starts to deal with abstract thinking and all of that, you know, and uh those, at that time, the kid says, wait a minute, I can think for myself. I'm not going to listen to these people anymore. But they're so trained that they have to listen to a voice outside their head, and the only one, other one available is what? Is, the other teenagers. Right. And I've had parents say to me, I just don't understand it. He's changed so much. And I say, no, nah, he didn't change. He used to listen to a voice outside of his head. Now he just listens to a different one. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, not that, an issue we have really with clothing. Shame. So that, how does that apply to technology? Issue. It's a huge it's issue. It's a huge issue. Yeah, it's our daughter is huge, so strong. Yeah. She, uh, she's wanted, sort of the leader. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Um, Let him finish, because yeah. I would love the gu- what guidelines would you give parents? Well, the guidelines um, in a healthy family are this technology is around. It has... Uh, Great benefits. There are a lot of problems that uh, can happen. Uh, We want two things here. We want the kids, first of all, to know that they're welcome to have that technology as long as it doesn't become a problem. That's the first thing I want to work with them on. So uh, when we see it becoming a problem, that's when we need to step in and hopefully we won't have to. So what kind of things do you suppose could cause a problem? You know, And one of them would be if uh, at the dinner table, I only see the top of your head, that's a problem. You know, right. if it interferes with family life, it could be a problem. And <clears throat> the other thing I want to do is to instill in my kids early and uh, when I say early, that means before tomorrow, because it's never too late to do these things. But uh, I want to get the kids to believe that their parents are really, really wise. Would you like to know how to convince your kids that they, that you are really wise? Please. And the way you do that is you, uh, when they're going to do something that you think is wrong, never say, hey, don't do that. And because our next words are usually why they shouldn't do it. If you do this, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. And any kid worth his salt will say, no, it won't, I'll be okay. And uh, they're likely to do it. So I want to say to them, oh, I don't think I'd do that. You know, if I did that, here's an example. I don't think I'd go out there and mouth off to those bigger, stronger kids. Um, You know, if I did that, I might get a fat lip or a bloody nose, or I might have to carry my tooth around in an envelope for a week or say, and uh, (laughs) so then you drop it. And then you secretly pray early in life while the (laughs) price tags are affordable that they go out and do it anyway. Right. And then right when this other kid provides all this training for them, they say to themselves, wow, I think my dad said this might happen. My dad must really be wise. So if they hear that often, uh, oh, I don't think I'd do that because they don't have anything to fight. They can't fight you when you say you're not going to do it. They can only fight you when you say, don't you do that. So yeah, no, now, true. by the time they're getting to the point where they can misuse this uh, technology and be self-destructive in the in the uh, aftermath with it, uh, we can say, oh, I tell you, I don't think I would be doing that because this is, and then say, what do you think? And uh, that's where they might just, might just happen to listen to us. You know, it's interesting. Uh, that Go ahead. I'm sorry. It's, it's interesting you say that because we, and I learned a lot of this, you know, over time by doing this, implementing these strategies. Um, one of the things that, that I took on as my daughter came into her teenage years, where we live, kids tend to be almost overly sheltered when they're really young. And then all of a sudden they're acting out when they're in junior high and high school. Sure. And so what I figured out through all of this was that my job is not to shelter her, it's to teach her to respond appropriately, help her to learn to respond appropriately to when things do happen, as opposed to hiding them from her. And so when it comes to technology, you know, we, I have the unfair advantage of the fact that we see troubled kids. And so we have those stories and we share them with her and we share what's going on, um, you know, problems that can happen, but we were brutally honest. So it's like, you're going to come across porn on the internet. Uh, on the inter- on the yeah. internet, you're going to encounter these problems X, Y, and Z, and I have to trust enough that you're smart enough to know that if you see a photo or you see something that is inappropriate, you are intelligent enough 
to respond appropriately, mm-hmm. as opposed to, oh my gosh, you have to stay away from that because you can't shelter yeah. them from it. You can't. You can't shelter. It's going to be there. It's going to be right in their face. Yeah. So, so what are so, some uh, quick tips? One of the ways, one of the things we do for parents is help them understand when their kids are ready for a lot of these temptations. And uh, the way we do that is, let's suppose they want to go off to uh, this party and you're worried about drugs, alcohol, and different things like that going on there. Uh, We don't say to them, no, you can't do that. You're not old enough. You say, well, I wonder if you're ready for something like that. Tell me what your plan is if somebody suggests this, this, or this to you. Well, what do you got? To, what do you got in mind? And they say, "Oh, you know, I don't do that." Well, that's not a plan, so they're not ready. They say, "Well, I just tell them it's stupid." And so, and you say to yourself, "Well, you know, I can't say that to my best friend. I don't know how a kid can say that to his best friend." So, uh, not ready. But if a kid says, "Well, you know, I just here's what I tell him. I tell him this. I tell him this. I tell him that." Uh, uh, then you, they've got a plan. They've got a fallback position, and you, you can feel pretty confident. I remember one time my parents said to this, uh, the kid said, oh, I'm trying to remember how this all went. Uh, he said, oh, you know, I, I, I don't think that's going to be a problem at the party. The kid offered me drugs. I just tell him that my parents are so paranoid about stuff like that, if they knew that I was even talking to you about it, they would already be draining my savings account for college and putting me in rehab. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, a kid like that, you're not going to worry about him. Right. So our, our daughter, she's 13 and she was at school and they, uh, word got out that there was going to be first party, you know, the, of, with that age group, 13, um, where there was going to be alcohol. And she's, she's really funny. She is one of those kids who will tell her friends how dumb it is. Um, but yeah. she, to a whole group, she basically told them how disappointed she was, that she had higher hopes for them as, you know, her friend group. And oh my God. You know, it was hilarious. <laughs> this is why they call her mom. But, um, and then she went on to tell them about all the reasons they shouldn't go, the consequences. And a couple of the kids actually listened to her and didn't go. So, you know, you, 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 if you do this early enough and your kids are strong enough and I think develop that voice in their head like you're talking about, you just might end up with a kid who's a leader like that. And if not, then it's great to be able to, you know, have them voice that plan like that. Um, Because I think it is hard for kids with, you know, most of them succumb to that peer pressure. Oh, yeah. I I hope your daughter runs for president. I know. (laughs) We do too. (laughs) I'll vote for her. Yeah. (laughs) Well, this is so helpful. When we come back, we're going to talk about parenting with love and logic for young adults. It's a huge issue. Uh, The average age children leave home in the United States is 26. So there's really parenting beyond 18. Stay with us. We're here with Dr. Jim Fay, author of Parenting with Love and Logic. You can learn more about his work at loveandlogic.com. Welcome back. We are here with Dr. Jim Fay, the Brain Warriors Way podcast. Uh, this is our Love and Logic, Parenting with Love and Logic week. We have been having so much fun. And today we're going to talk about young adults because what I've seen as a child psychiatrist, the, the issues don't end at 17 or 18, that there are huge issues when you send away, uh, send a child away to college, which I'm actually not a fan of. Your brain is not fully developed until you're 25 in girls, (laughs) more like 28 in boys. When, you know, I see kids who really struggled through adolescence and parents send them across the country to school, it's often where their first psychotic break happens, where they get depressed, they become overweight, maybe even suicidal. And, and so parenting young adults is 
really important. So I have a question on that, though. Um, does a lot of it have to do with how you raise your kids young and how strong they are before they go as far as what age they're ready to leave? So we'll let Dr. Fay weigh in on that. Yes. Let's jump into this issue, Dr. Fay, of uh, older teenagers and young adults. What has been your experience as you have helped people parent with love and logic? Well, the lucky ones who have been parenting this way <clears throat> don't worry a whole lot about their kids at that point and don't get a lot of uh, return you know, kids coming back to live at home. But, um, you know, when we, you were talking about college and how kids go off to college to start with, uh, how they view the financial thing makes an awful lot of difference in what goes on out there. Um, we're, we're strong advocates for uh, telling kids that uh, it, uh, <clears throat> you want them to go to college someday and that um, they need to save up enough money to pay for the first their first quarter of school out there uh, so that uh, you can support them as they go along. And what happens is they, they pay for their first quarter of school, and then if they bring back appropriate grades, we reimburse them for the money that they spent on that first quarter, and then they have money for the next quarter and so on. Interesting. Those kids usually get through school uh, in a different way than uh, other kids who go there to party. Because uh, they, they've got some skin in the game. That, that makes a lot of difference. It's, uh, it's not something we think about often uh, with kids away from home. But uh, they're going to... I, I don't send my kids off to college if I think they're going to go off to party to right. start with. Yeah, that's really interesting. So uh, one of the things that we implemented early on was um, teaching decision making with Chloe. So and uh -huh. also problem solving. So even though you know we travel a lot, and even when we travel, um, there was a time that she and I got lost somewhere. And we didn't have um, cell phones. We were out of the country. And so she freaked out at first. And I'm like, okay, so what would you do if I wasn't here? And I literally had her, well, I already knew what to do, but I literally had her walk us through each step of what to do because we were in a very remote area, couldn't find a cab. So it was a really good lesson. Things like that that we've done with her since she was young and then, you know, just started stacking on more age-appropriate decision-making, but not easy decision-making so that she has to figure things out. Um, I think that that's made her a lot stronger, don't you, Daniel? Absolutely. I think that uh, it sounds to me like you were using that technique called guiding kids to own and solve their own problems. You know, when the kids are facing a problem, instead of solving it for them or telling them what they ought to do, it's, uh, oh, wow, would you like to hear what some other kids have tried before? then give them a list of different ideas. And each time, with each new idea, we say, how do you think that would work? How do you think that would work? And then uh, we often start out with the uh, worst one first. Right. And uh, because they're going to reject that one anyway, you don't want to waste a good one. That's funny. So uh, throw out several ones. And even if you don't have a good one, you could throw out several bad ones and say, how do you think that would work? And then at the end, just say, well, I've run out of ideas. Good luck. And uh, <clears throat> that whole idea that the quality of their life is going to depend on those kind of decisions. If that is going on uh, early before they have to leave the house, um, they're going to handle themselves a whole lot better out there. So one thing I've noticed um, with young adults, uh, well, Chloe's only 13, but I've noticed with some of the parents that we know of either teenagers or young adults, they never did, they talk about their kids paying consequences, but then they don't follow through. And I think it's painful to let your kids pay consequences. So for example, um, in the fifth grade or fourth grade, Chloe had a group project. My rule is I don't take homework to school. If you forget it, you forget it. And um, that's another one I learned because her grades aren't my grades. It's not a reflection on me as a person. So I 
uh, I got a call from her teacher, not from Chloe. Her teacher is saying it's the only time my daughter's ever forgotten something at school, uh, at home that she needed for school. But the teacher called me and she said, you know, could you bring this to school because she has a group project and their grade, all of their grades depend on it. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry about that. I'm in a meeting. Chloe knows I I can't bring, I can't bring homework to school. And so she knows that's her responsibility. And she said, really, you're not going to bring it to school, even though it's a group project. I said, that's not my problem. It's her problem. And she was, she was stunned. And then she laughed and she said, you know, I actually wish more parents would do this (laughs) because then I wouldn't be making these calls. And I said, so why didn't Chloe call me? She said, because her first response was, my mom's not going to bring it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that, uh, when we have to worry about their behavior out there, uh, we're not going to be paying for them to do self-destructive things. Right. Um, uh, I know a lot of people who worry about the fact that their kids drink at parties, and they still let them drive there. Right. You know, uh, the rule in our house was, uh, hey, you can use the family car as long as I never worry about uh, alcohol. Yeah, as long as I trust you. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, well, you can trust me. Yeah. I trust your, uh, I trust your intelligence. What I don't trust quite yet is your experience and wisdom. Mm-hmm. So, uh, as long as I don't worry about it, uh, you've got a car to drive. And then when we smell alcohol one night, oh, wow, this was rough. What's your guess about the family car? Yep. You know, the, that, that, uh, and you uh, restrict that car until you're not worried about it again. It tears a little piece of your heart off. Yep. But then you know that, wait a minute, there's a whole lot better chance when he's away from home that things are going to go a lot better. Well, and it doesn't tear your heart out nearly as much as I have several friends who have lost kids to drunk driving. So there's oh, nothing more yeah. painful than that. And that's, you know... Um, yeah, it's much easier, like you said, pay the consequences while they're cheap. The other thing is my daughter knows if she gets arrested for something like that, I'm not getting up in the middle of the night to go get her. So (laughs) she's going to stay there. So, you know, but she knows that I mean it, you know, you know, when they get away from home, (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry. Um, when they get away from home, most often you hear phone calls from them, but most often it's when they're down in the dumps or they need something. And those are those wonderful times when they call home and say, oh, I've run out of money. And you so, so desperately want to just send them a whole bunch so they don't have to suffer. And uh, what pays so much better is, oh boy, what do you think you're going to do? I know you you can solve a lot of problems. How are you how are you going to solve this one? Interesting. And, uh, there's another technique that we've used uh when we wrote the grandparenting book, we thought we had written everything that grandparents needed and then we had a focus group read it and they say, "Well, you didn't put in there what to do when the kids are away from home or our grand or our adult kids call up and they want money and things like that. So we had to stick in a little thing about that where they call up and say, you know, I was hoping that you could uh, pay for uh, Ralph's baseball this year. You know, we're kind of short. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing with that. Uh, Give me a few days. I'll get back to you and I'll let you know what will work for me. And you buy yourself some time so that you can get up your nerve to say what you really need to say. And sometimes you can say, yeah, I think that was something I'd enjoy doing. Or other times you say, you know, I might have an extra $50, but uh, you've thought it through. So uh, that whole business of buying time when things are going wrong out there really becomes important at that age. I like that. That's actually really helpful. So you're not on the spot when they... When they do that. You know, I teach my ADD patients to do that all the time. It's, you know, I want you to practice in the mirror. I have to think about it. Because too often they just impulsively say yes when it really doesn't fit the goals they have for their life. This has been so incredibly helpful, Dr. Fay. What, what are some, 
and and this can apply to children or young adults uh, at any age. In the years you've been doing this, what are the three or four tips you would leave people with to really h- highlight parenting with love and logic? Well, first of all, that we really have to get um, begging, backtalk, and arguing under control. That uh, kids just, when we set a limit, it has to be the limit. It has to almost be my way or the highway, but not in a nice way. So that technique about uh, when uh, they test the limits, we just say, what did I say, and walk away. And then have a, a, a scheduled time each, um, each week when kids know they can come to their parents and talk about anything that they don't think is fair about how the family runs. And we oh, say, good. we'll be really good listeners at that time, and we may or may not change what's going on here. So that's, that becomes really important. Um, the whole idea of buying time when things go wrong. Have a tattoo on your finger that says, I'm not sure how to react to that. I'll get back to you. <laughs> I like that. So that when you actually deal with it, you're in a calm, loving manner. That's, that becomes important. The whole idea of, uh, we didn't talk a lot about empathy, but um, parents having one empathetic sound on the tip of their tongue that they can spit out without having to think when things go wrong for the, with their kids, instead of immediately trying to fix it or telling them what to do, but to uh, have something that indicates, boy, I'm with you on this. Uh, it might be, wow. Or, you know, uh, in some states, it would probably sound like, dang. <laughs> or if you were out in California, it would probably sound like, Dude, you know, <laughs> bless your heart, you know, and give them a hug. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's kind of, and then you have that available. When things go wrong, the kids wreck the family car. You know that you can buy some time. You can be really empathetic. You can say, oh, wow. Oh, boy, that's rough, you know. And what's funny about that is, and, uh, Doctor, you know all about how that changed brain chemistry for yourself when you do that. Yep. You, you, uh, you feel a whole lot different. Then you can say, oh, that's rough. Wreck the family car. Well, not to fear. You'll be driving again someday as soon as you get <laughs> that car paid for. How do you want to handle that? I and love see, that. you still got that fine relationship with your kid, and you haven't destroyed it by saying, what in the world are you thinking? How many times, you know, and ranting and raving like the neighbors do. That's awesome. Yeah, no, it's, uh, those consequences have been really helpful. And one thing that I think I learned from you that is just, I mean, I always say, oh, I'm so sorry, sweetie. And then I think about what I'm going to say, but, um, or that, that, you know, that must feel terrible, but you know, I, I think it's so helpful uh, one of the things that I've learned from you on how to handle those situations is uh, when, not so much when she has an accident like that, but when she says something or when she used to say things that were disrespectful or difficult to deal with, um, it's, you know, I don't, I don't do things for people who treat me that way. And you really shouldn't yeah. either. You should expect someone to respect you. And when you drain my yeah. energy, it means I don't have the time and energy to do other things for you. Yeah, it would be nice for all parents to have a <clears throat> a sign on a kid's door, and it says, "Happy to do the things you want when I feel respected, and your chores are done." Yep. And uh, that can take care of an awful lot of problems. Yeah. They come and say, "Well, will you drive me over?" So, well, did you ask in a nice way? Yeah. And are are your jobs done? So important. If not, well, we'll try it someday when, when you haven't finished. Love it. So helpful. Well, we want to thank you for uh, your work. Uh, how important it's been to our family. Uh, the time you've given us uh, today, we will continue to spread uh, the word 
Uh, For sure. Um, I just want to, before we wrap up, I just want to say, so what has been so helpful, your work has literally changed my relationship, which then, of course, changes your life to some degree. Um, it's been so helpful. And I think combining that with what we know about brain development and brain problems and mm -hmm. how to avoid some of those, and uh, it's just you know, I've got this person who's one of my favorite people now, as opposed to a teenager where I roll my eyes and go, well, that's just typical teenage behavior. I don't think it is typical anymore. You know, as long no, as your child's healthy. No, it doesn't have to be. Yeah. No, see, I got to thinking along the way, I need to change my ways and find better ways to working with my kids because someday they're going to pick my nursing home for me. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's actually one of the reasons I really focus on being healthy and doing the right things because I love my children. I don't want to live with them. I want to be independent. And that means as an adult, I have to parent myself with love and logic. Absolutely. It's like, there you go. What is that decision? You know, how's that going to turn out for, for my you? health for and my right. health, for my mind, independence, uh, independence mm -hmm. and all of that. So uh, cool. Well, this has been delightful. I've really enjoyed my time with you. Oh, it's fabulous. You also have materials for relationships, right? Like marriages and things like that. Yeah, we do. We, there's uh, the, <clears throat> it's amazing. There must be a hundred different things that we have. It's awesome. It's so go to loveandlogic.com Love and, Logic. uh, yeah. and sign up for their uh, emails. And uh, this information can help your children. It can help yourself as a parent. Uh, it can even help your relationships. Thanks so much, Dr. Faye. So much fun. Uh, I hope I get to meet you someday. Thank you. We will look forward to it. You're listening to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. <laughs>